All right, thanks. So I'm Don Trashinsky, uh, CTO, Global Sales Organization. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about SD-WAN and the use case uh, that we call SD-WAN. And uh, of course, I'm crazy enough to pull up another live demo uh, that is out there running on uh, live internet and uh, lots of other uncontrollable uh, network paths. So um, we, uh, first of all, I guess I wanted to, uh, you know, we've been spending a lot of time inside the box today, if you think about it. Um, you know, we've been talking about metadata and you know, how we transfer that between uh, nodes. And, um, and I guess, you know, what I like to do, I guess, with the SD-WAN use case is kind of take a step outside the box, right? Talk a little bit more about, you know, an end-to-end -end enterprise architecture, what this would look like in the real world. Uh, maybe talk about a little bit of the business value uh, that we can bring uh, to the SD-WAN use case. And so, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is really based on a, uh, uh, tier, well, a large enterprise, Fortune 500, uh, uh, enterprise architecture where they were looking to deploy um, potentially a combination of nodes uh, in the branch sites, uh, retail branch sites. Um, they were looking for a good combination of uh, price performance but also flexibility for the future. Uh, so they literally couldn't decide between uh, running a virtualized environment on the branch and then running uh, an appliance version on the branch. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, we, we can run, of course, any other form factor. And so in this case, you're seeing a VM host um, that's literally paired um, HA uh, with an appliance version, right? And so uh, obviously, typically, a customer wouldn't choose uh, both platforms, but uh, you know, one in the sense of uh, appliance reliability, maybe integrated LTE, um, the other one, uh, a VM host with uh, the ability to deploy applications dynamically um, out you know, within the enterprise. Um, we've had another customer, uh, uh, in fact, kind of shrink down that VM host. Um, and, uh, and really, it's an IoT use case uh, where they're running Docker on a very compact appliance, right? So you can get these, uh, these appliances down to uh, you know, $300 and less uh, in, the, uh, in the branch office, um, run containers, right? And then we can do the same form of segmentation for containers running in a Docker host um, at the branch. Uh, another interesting aspect of this use case is, um, is service chaining. I'm not sure we spent a lot of time talking about that today. Uh, we did talk about it, I think, maybe in the context of, uh, of Zscaler, uh, the ability to service chain in third-party services. Um, we're not normally in the business of decrypting our customers' traffic, uh, uh, but you can embed a proxy uh, in, in, that, uh, in that node through service chaining. So uh, Palo Alto, for example, with a VM100 as a partner, um, and so that would be in an appliance form factor. Um, again, those can run in KVM, uh, can be chained in using the tenant and service model. Uh, we had a customer very interested in um, uh, existing uh, WAN optimization gear. They didn't want to throw it away. It was a big investment. Uh, we can service chain in uh, third-party tools uh, such as WAN opt, but then that session context, right? So we think about the, the session context of secure vector routing can carry that WAN optimization context up to a data center and sort of reverse service chain it right up at the data center. Um, so again, the session awareness can be extremely useful uh, to carry context from a branch office to a central office. And in fact, and sometimes I, um, you know, I say the flexibility there to, to run uh, local security services, centralized security services, and do that on a per application basis is a huge win uh, for the SD-WAN use case. Um, uh, again, you can have uh, Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi context. Uh, every single branch and every single branch office can have um, essentially a single tenant definition. Um, somebody's, I think, focuses on, on wireless. But that single tenant definition is global in nature. So um, if I define a Wi-Fi uh, tenant in terms of an access point, or I define that in terms of an uh, ingress interface, um, if I want to make a change to the policy, uh, for, for a routing of uh, Wi-Fi traffic that can be done globally. Um, and when we talk about being done globally, um, and we talk about there may be services uh, available and reachable in the data center, right? Um, uh, in this architecture, I've got um, a central uh, 12018 nodes. I also have data center-based 12018 nodes. Um, uh, in this case, I'm also showing, uh, again, real world, uh, multiple private data centers. Uh, and in fact, um, and this is kind of a combination of secure vector routing as well as traditional BGP. Um, and there was a little bit of discussion about overlay and, and um, 
and, uh, and underlay. Um, this is essentially a blending of, of overlay and underlay. Uh, we can run BGP over SVR, right, and represent uh, a data topology in the data center uh, using BGP as some enterprises do, right? You may have existing uh, nodes in a very large enterprise. Uh, you may have uh, back-end paths. Um, they may be using AS path prepending. Um, these are things that you can't come in and change necessarily overnight. So in, you know, in a, a truly, uh, you know, a router-based um, SD-WAN architecture, uh, you can now, you know, introduce 120AT I would say it's kind of the blending of the, of the overlay and underlay. So essentially you can do traditional routing when you don't have any other need or reason, right? And, uh, and secure vector routing when you want to do tight path control and quality of service and, you know, and uh, QoS um, you know, and, and, and prioritization and link failover, right? And so uh, this blending, I, I find so many SD-WAN solutions out there just um, you know, they're, they're just lowest common denominator um, tunnel-based load balancers, right? And, uh, and so having a true routing solution and then the ability to override traditional routing with secure vector routing is a huge win, right? And so when might we do that? Um, we might do that for cloud-based traffic, right? So we can have a 128T instance in the cloud that's literally part of the SD-WAN. I'll show you that in uh, demo topology. And, uh, and again, that's treated like any other node in the network, right? So now we blended our enterprise, right, with the cloud. Um, that can be BGP or BGP free. Uh, will, we'll show, in fact, later on, we've got a cloud demo where we'll spin that up dynamically. Um, and then uh, cloud gateways you find in some uh, SD-WAN architectures. It's optional. It can be a path for steering traffic out an alternative egress. Um, interestingly enough, um, a customer threw a, a use case at us and they said, well, uh, what if I have guest Wi-Fi at, you know, many, many sites and um, I'm overloading my internet path, right? And, uh, you know, how do I deal with that? Uh, interestingly enough, it, the tenant service model, we think of it as being very granular and segmented, you know, down to ports and paths, but we can be extremely broad as well, right? So let's take a default gateway running through a cloud gateway Let's take five default gateways. Let's take 2,000 branch offices. And we can literally assign and divide traffic from a branch office to multiple internet routes, literally on the fly, right? So if you think of that use case of um, it's, it's not necessarily segmentation down to the port and protocol, right, which we think of hyper-segmentation. It's like having five different named default routes. And I'm literally assigning traffic to one or more default routes in, in, the, uh, in the network. And so that's, a, that's really a huge win for traffic management. And I'll uh, try to show a little bit of that through the demo as well. Other, uh, I guess, components we're showing here are uh, LTE, internet, satellite, uh, MPLS. We can run BGP with the underlay. We can roll, run BGP as an overlay. So. Uh, we integrate extremely well with existing MPLS. Um, I think it was already discussed that we can do uh, secure vector routing or not. Um, so we can learn routes essentially from the quote unquote underlay and, uh, and blend very well. Uh, and again, low overhead. Uh, we work well over LTE. Uh, we've done all the work, and I don't know if it was ever discussed, but uh, we've done all the work to do uh, NAT traversal, um, dynamically keep pinholes alive, do outbound only. You can literally have NATs and outbound NATs in the path of an SD-WAN connection, which may be a cable modem, broadband, uh, and we can punch outbound only to cloud and data center resources. Another interesting aspect of this is that it can be multi-tier, right? And so we talk a lot about uh, secure vector routing being a, being a huge win when we try to, you know, try to scale up, right? And so uh, in the SD-WAN use case, uh, you know, so many, uh, of the largest networks are hesitant to dive into SD-WAN because they see it as a scaling issue. And um, tunnels, many thousands of tunnels, and of course the N-square problem, or even just trying to do state management. Now the 128T solution can introduce an intermediate layer uh, in an SD-WAN um, and, uh, and help scale up that way. So, any other questions on kind of outside the box um, SD-1 architecture. We'll go more into cloud in the next session. 
All right, so multi-path routing. I think we discussed this uh, again previously, but um, you know, it is a big part of the SD-WAN use case, right? Um, you know, and, and we call it the use case, right? The SD-WAN use case, because essentially we're doing enterprise routing, cloud routing, and SD-WAN uh, within the WAN, so software-defined WAN. Um, we are ensuring optimal path uh, selection uh, by per service based on quality, right? Again, LTE can be a backup path. We'll have that adjacency established over LTE. Um, and MPLS, of course, uh, can be a primary path, and we can route between wired and wireless. Um, we can have, uh, of course, any combination of underlay uh, or uh, transport network. Um, we can name the transport networks uh, according to neighborhood. Um, I think it was discussed previously that we can then uh, create sort of arbitrary topologies using uh, say we define MPLS network number one and MPLS network number two as two different neighborhoods. We can have two different hubs and two different spokes for two different MPLS neighborhoods. So creating your topology of hub and spoke full mesh um, uh, is extremely easy um, in the data model. When we do uh, session migration, um, I think it was pointed out, but maybe not fully pointed out. Um, so again, so we've got, uh, you know, it's configured uh, by user based on needs of the service. So a particular set of tenants can have a particular set of services, um, maybe Office 365, maybe voice. Um, and then uh, of course the uh, ingress branch will uh, monitor you know, path performance. Um, I think it was emphasized that we're passing metadata as part of the se initial session setup, right? And then when we have a failover, uh, we're resending that metadata along the alternative path to do session correlation, right? So part of that session failover is the sending of metadata along the new path. What that does is, it, again, it carries the exact same context with the session. Um, it carries a session identifier um, again, your same five tuple will be set up a, a, along the alternative path. If you've set up a NAT, an egress NAT, uh, on the head end, um, that session will be correlated and you'll literally be f uh, flowing across the same path. Uh, you can have, and I'll show in uh, the demo, you can have several different policies uh, for traffic. You can have non-revertive or non-failover traffic. You can have uh, failover. You can have revertive failover. Um, and uh, your session migration is fully within your control. I'll actually demonstrate that live using a voice call. And uh, SD-WAN, uh, you know, so we, we've talked, we, you know, again, it's, it's a huge part um, of the business value that we bring. Lane demonstrated that we're, we're running 30% uh, less bandwidth. But let's also talk about entropy um, and uh, how that uh, applies for, specifically in satellite use cases, uh, low bandwidth use cases. Um, uh, we've seen, uh, you know, multi T1 uh, branch offices in the SD-WAN use case. Um, <laughs> we've literally been pulled in by customers um, that have said, um, "Hey, we've got some satellite links out there. Um, satellites actually increasing in bandwidth and, and performance. Um, there's all kinds of cool, uh, you know, Leo, Mio, Geo uh, alternatives out there for uh, for satellite transport." And, uh, and they literally pull us in, they say, you know, this tunneled SD-WAN stuff is not working well over satellite. Um, you know, they're having trouble, uh, you know, with encrypted tunnels. And so, um, you know, we've in live networks seen, uh, you know, as much as, you know, 7x improvement uh, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the bandwidth and download speeds um, in the SD-WAN use case. So, um, again, you'll see this still, there <laughs> all kinds of places that you'll end up still seeing satellite, tactical environments in DoD, of course, um, oil platforms, you'll have a combination of microwave and uh, um, satellite, um, uh, potentially LTE links out there. Um, so, you know, this, this use case is not going away, right? I mean, we think, uh, you know, the throw bandwidth at the problem, right? And, um, uh, you know, and saving 30% is not such an issue, but, um, uh, absolutely, in the uh, you know in the uh, low bandwidth link uh, uh, scenario, we're, we're we're extremely strong. I think it was mentioned also that we do uh, window size scaling, uh, local acknowledgments uh, on a per session basis. Um, so for uh, sessions that do traverse uh, uh, high latency links, in this case, you know six to seven hundred milliseconds, 
uh, we can do the local uh, acknowledgements that you would expect out of a WAN optimization solution. So uh, again, that's kind of leveraging the TCP intelligence of the of the 128T solution. Um, overlapping I, uh, IP addresses, I think we decided that we hadn't uh, really discussed this, but uh, you could see this in a managed service provider trying to provide services to multiple customers, but uh, we do see uh, this in enterprise use cases, um, certainly through consolidation, um, very large networks where address migrations uh, are, are challenging. Um, and so um, it, it can't be emphasized enough uh, how uh, secure vector routing can be used to essentially now assign words, right? So if you think about trying to do this in, you know, legacy technology, I'm going to have, um, you know, an edge VRF, and I'm going to have uh, uh, route distinguishers, an import and export from an MPLS core instance. Uh, this is service provider MPLS, right? And it's extremely complex to try to bring that sort of, uh, you know, level of um, uh, interworking between multiple IP uh, address spaces to the SD-WAN use case. And so, uh, you know, by, by assigning literally tenant A and tenant B, uh, we've already uh, separate, we've got, main we've maintained context, right? So 3.3.3.3 uh, for tenant A now literally has a different word that it's being used when we, when we, do, when we send the metadata to the data center, right? So we can literally keep context between overlapping address space um, you could deploy the exact same IP address to all your guest Wi-Fi access points or um, any uh, you know, overlapping uh, retail locations. You want to keep very consistent addressing, um, and that'll all be sorted out and, and with context at the head end. It sounded like there was a question maybe by now. All right. So again, uh, I think I'm, uh, oh, yeah, there's one more slide. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I'll show this a bit more in the cloud demo, uh, how we dynamically spin up capacity. Um, that's going to leverage, uh, you know, some of the zero touch deployment and, uh, uh, you know, zero touch upgrade uh, features, uh, and those will actually be shown in the in the demo video. Um, but it absolutely is part of the SD-WAN use case, right? Um, you want to be able to punch these things out uh, repeatedly, uh, repetitively with consistency, right? And so uh, the conductor acts as a single repository for configuration data. Uh, you can then templatize and, and uh, propagate the same configuration. Um, much of the data model, again, the tenant and the service data model, is inherited by the router. So a router configuration in a very large-scale SD-WAN deployment, um, rather than being a set of, uh, you know, again, routing tables and, and um, uh, tunnels, uh, you literally just have interfaces and adjacencies associated with the router. Right, and so it inherits, and a new branch just simply inherits the uh, the same uh, top level uh, objects that um, uh, that every other node has. And then when you change a policy to maybe increase the priority of voice traffic or decrease the priority of, of video traffic, um, that will be inherited across the entire data model. So uh, you know, zero touch features and uh, zero touch deployment and repeated deployment is a huge part of the SD WAN use case for large enterprises. Uh, retail applications um, and certainly supported by the conductor model. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the biggest challenge um, in scaling up to thousands of sites, uh, you know, uh, what had turned out to be, um, it, you know, conductor management rather than tunnel management, right? And where uh, any other solution is going to have an extremely complex, um, you know, network of tunnels. Um, you know, we had to do a lot of work on, uh, again, just, you know, scaling and performance and good user experience for many, many thousands of branch sites. So, um, again, zero touch upgrade, um, I think it may have been covered, um, but there's a great inventory system on the conductor that uh, will tell you about the availability of new software. Um, tell it, and in fact, any time a node's brought on, there's some auditing done, um, and it will uh, determine the uh, suitability of the, of the node for 128T, potentially even uh, download 128T if it's a, if a brand new instance that doesn't have a software load, and then, um, you know, and then uh, bring it up to speed and, and bring it onto the network. So um, <laughs> here's the part that uh, I have many things outside of my control, but uh, we will do a demo, a uh, live demo of what I call my sandbox. And um, so here we have, uh, let's just go to the top level dashboard. Are, are you able to see that? Or uh, actually, why is that not switching between displays? Put it to X 
mix it out of the PowerPoint presentation first. That's right. Microsoft yeah. is in control. Yes, they are in control. Um, all right, so here we are. Um, let me uh, increase this, the font size here. Uh, this is what I call my sandbox. Um, you know, I, I, I take this topology, it's, it's literally kind of grown um, it's to become essentially an operational network. I use it for a lot of my own uh, purposes. Um, it is my SD-WAN deployment, if you will. Um, it's got lots of routers. I've got some in uh, AWS and, and Azure. Um, this is, again, the top-level uh, dashboard. Uh, you could see based on the, uh, the internet winds whether uh, you know, there would be an alarm um, in any one of these nodes. Um, I think we talked a little bit about different platforms, but here's an example of um, regardless of the platform, whether it's an appliance feel, whether it's a virtualized feel, whether it's a cloud feel, it's the same look and feel uh, you know, in the 120AT uh, dashboard. So here's an HA, HA node. That's, that's two nodes that are represented as one, right? So you can literally manage a high availability router, two physical platforms, two sets of physical interfaces. That'll, that'll manage as one node. Here's one sitting out in an oil platform and it's got some simulated satellite traffic. Um, when we kind of, uh, again, we brush the mouse over um, any one of these nodes, um, again, all these uh, adjacencies were generated by your preferred topology. I want a full mesh on MPLS. I want a hub and spoke on AWS uh, or Azure. Um, and that, um, you know, that is uh, represented in the chart here. Um, these are, this is a live node running in, uh, in Azure. Uh, I call it my Azure gateway. Um, uh, it's peering with, uh, you know, several nodes, and then here's a live uh, node running in AWS. Um, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the data model. Um, uh, I guess I want to give you a little bit more of a real-world use case um, where I uh, talk about, um, you know, just one of the interesting, um, interesting use cases that I was presented. Um, so I, again, guest Wi-Fi, a uh, good use case because um, a lot of enterprises are kind of debate about the level of control that they want to put over guest Wi-Fi. It's a nice global data model. Um, you know, in my case, I, um, uh, I've assigned it, you know, a few services. Um, multicast video, internet is egressing through Azure. So I'm using an Azure-based gateway. Uh, can have a set of services chained in within the Azure cloud. Um, it is attached to the VoIP card, but I have an interesting service here called DNS, right? So um, the use case was, uh, hey, I want to put some DNS security, maybe some filtering for some sites um, into my, um, into my, you know, in this case, guest Wi-Fi network. Of course, you can do it across the enterprise network. Well, I, I don't know what my uh, tenant might be uh, configured to use, right? And um, it's so common to use the Google DNS server, right? So in my case here, uh, I had a bunch of clients that were out there and already deployed using a DNS uh, server based on IP address. Think about DNS migrations. Um, uh, you know, if I want to migrate my DNS server from uh, prem uh, to cloud or to another service, um, I literally I'm going to have to put in a DHCP address maybe into my uh, into my DHCP server. Maybe that client's going to cache the DNS address. Um, the 128T fabric can literally catch DNS, right? So I can take DNS traffic to 8888 or whatever my gateway was that was assigned, snag port 53, TCP and UDP, um, and then route that completely, essentially exception route that to, to traditional IP. So again, we may have a default route going out um, you know, to the internet, but I can snag DNS and send it to a DNS proxy. <laughs> Okay, so if you're doing that, so, so let's, let's go to the, this idea of migrating DNS services, right? Um, you set up that rule and you start working through all of those areas where you have the, the old DNS server configured. Do you then have the capability of seeing how often that rule is being hit to, to find? Is, okay. Thanks for the lead in. <laughs> there it is. So when I define a service, so again, the beauty of this name data model um, and having the data model kind of be part of the routing is that when the enterprise in the SD-WAN use case or any other use case, uh, security use case, defines something that they cared about, 
it's suddenly now tracked on a session by session basis using that same word. So I didn't have to do anything else. Now I have a stats bucket, essentially 800 stats bucket on every single router um, that's classifying that session as DNS. And, and DNS, you know, it could be port 53, but it might be a, a particular subset of DNS. So the way we structure our SD-WAN uh, topologies is typically, they're typically around whatever the business cares about. Right, and uh, and that's extremely valuable. And then you get this dashboard, um, as literally as a result. And these are different machines I have around the network, and they're querying DNS. Um, sneakily, I took my 8888. I route it to a, a DNS proxy. I do some logging, recording, and I send it to a DNS filtering website using an AnyCast address. And uh, that's it. I mean, it took literally um, about 10 minutes to set up a brand new AnyCast DNS service. Um, on this network, and it was a pretty cool use case, so I like to point that one out. Um, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're doing all right, but uh, not that great. So, um, all right, so uh, what else do we want to show? Um, you know, again, we talk a lot about failover, <laughs> uh, doing it, you know, doing it in action. I have a SIP client actually that's uh, running out to, um, it's running over the LTE network, uh, so voice over LTE. Uh, it's gonna hit uh, a gateway, it actually hits my AWS central gateway. Uh, it's then, I use secure vector routing to kind of bypass some outbound NATs and do some address interworking into a private network and I've got a SIP contact server <coughs> and uh, I can place a call uh, into my live uh, demo network. Um, this is handy because it's portable. Uh, that's out uh, and reachable on the internet. Um, actually, let me let it ring for a second. I think my ringer will come on, but you can see my, I've called myself. And uh, if anybody recognizes asterisk uh, music on hold, uh, <laughs> it's uh, asterisk music on hold. But I've literally taken a call, uh, Secure Vector routed it right, through the cloud back into a private premise network. Um, and that gave me a little bit of control over steering it across paths. So I have uh, a couple of paths in the network, broadband and MPLS, and now I have a VoIP call uh, that's running. Uh, again, I can get kind of real-time analytics and look at the bandwidths that are being sent. That's actually being sent twice over the link. Um, and I can look at my policies. <coughs> so I have a global policy um, that is uh, defined uh, for VoIP very specifically. Uh, interestingly, we have a service class called telephony, right? So that defines your queue behavior, right? So prioritization, DSCP, percentage of bandwidth that's gonna be uh, allocated to VoIP. Um, I've got a hunt, um, and I've got a session resiliency type of uh, a failover. This is the part where we get background music, which is cool. I like this. Um, <laughs> we're gonna have uh, a failover policy, a revertible failover policy. You may or may not want to you know, fail over back and forth between LTE, for example. Uh, a packet duplication and packet retransmission, uh, I think we, uh, we mentioned, can, can uh, clean things up in, um, in certain environments. Packet duplication will be used for forward air correction. I have a service level agreement that says I'm going to base it on latency loss and jitter. Maximum allowable loss, 2%. Latency, jitter. I have a set of vectors, right? Now, this is the secure vector routing notion. I'm going to route this over broadband with a priority of 5. I'm going to route this over MPLS with a priority of 10. And I'm not going to route my VoIP calls, in this case, over the internet, right? So extremely simple policy definition. And, uh, and that's uh, it's all it takes. Um, I have a wide area network simulator here. I'm going to fire it up and I'm going to inject some packet loss. Apply, boy, I can hardly read that. I'm going to apply some packet loss to uh, Ethernet 5. You can see this is starting to drop packets on that particular link. I can kind of refresh that, show that that's live. Come back to my 12018 networking platform. I also have a dashboard here. It's really a dashboard that's very specific to VoIP, right? Because my business cares about VoIP. If I drop a call, it could be revenue, right? So lost revenue uh, could be lost money. Um, and now I'm, my you know, 128T fabric is detecting packet loss on this VoIP path. Um, 
And uh, as you can see, my broadband is no longer suitable for my VoIP traffic, and I will go back to my uh, MPLS link. So that's done from a mobile phone. Look, no hands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's live. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's um, that's a good kind of uh, real-world application of web traffic. And the cool uh, asterisk music on hold is uh, is playing. And hang up the call, and uh, that traffic will go away. So we'll uh, talk about customers, I think, is the next one. We're going to talk yeah, about use cases and uh, customers that are really deploying this in the field. So yeah. besides me. <laughs> uh, a question I'll throw out now, um, because I think it goes into the customer uh, sure. conversation. When we start talking, when we, when we look at this as a solution, what we see is we see um, really two major areas of uh, of administration. There's the network side and then there's the security side and in a lot of organizations that's going to be two completely different teams. How does how does that play out as far as um, allowing the security to manage those security policies only, right? And allowing the network to manage the network policies. It, do you guys see issues with that and, and, and kind of how are things built in, in a way to create those demarcation points of control? That's a good question. Um, well, flexibility is key in my mind, um, right? And security means different things to different folks, right? So for uh, an enterprise that's worried about leaking uh, social security numbers, right? Security is different than um, a point of sale that's worried about segmentation, security, and control. So um, those different enterprises will have different security tools that may already be in place, right? With the security team versus the network routing team. right? Um, and so we can introduce the visibility, segmentation. Um, we can introduce an easier mechanism to carry context to existing security tools, mm -hmm. right? And in which case the security team is still uh, owning and operating uh, and or they become part of the, you know, security management team for the 120T router. I don't know what you're seeing out there. Yeah, and um, usually it happens like in a deployment, we usually go through both teams. First the routing team chooses us and then usually we have a review with the security team and show them, you know, how they can so also we have RBAC, so basically it allows you to create um, users who will have access to specific tools within the conductor. We also, because we are ICS certified, we had to do the crypto admin. Mm -hmm. So security keys can be managed separately by a crypto admin and no other admin can see it. So you have all those you have all those contexts available to it. Okay. Um, having said that, the division of security team and networking team, and we're clubbing it together, there is still the two teams to go through. Yeah, but we, we talk to both of them, usually in a deployment and, and discuss. And like Don mentioned, if they have security tools like Palo Alto or other things in, in play in the network, then we take, take the context from them and also service chain them or keep them in the path or keep them only for layer seven, level, layer seven functionality and so on. Um, what about Zscaler? I, we have a deployment with that. Um, it's the same idea. It's yeah. just a different. You know, now the tools are in the cloud, and and your you know 15 billion URLs that you're trying to filter right. um, are no longer in the prem, and and you can manage those through cloud tools. So that sometimes you see that as part of an SD WAN migration, they'll actually switch security tools to a cloud-based yeah. security uh, set of Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to talk about uh, customers uh, before we go to uh, the cloud the multi-cloud and the cloud demos these guys are going to show. Um, what I wanted to do is take a couple of different customer examples and show you. Uh, we already talked about some, but I want to go in a little bit detail what we did with them, why they see a savings with us, and who they are. I sort of, again, try to take a diff few different sets of customers, and especially, obviously, the ones which are publicly referenceable. Um, they are the examples we have taken. Uh, CMC Networks. Um, so who's CMC Networks? They are the largest Pan-African and Middle East carrier. Uh, they have 110 pops globally. Their network is pretty pretty vast and pretty spread out across all of Africa and Middle East. They're currently deployed with us in more than 40 countries. Um, uh, they're also building their core network using us for step to use step so that they can do the, the cool functionality we just talked about, you know, going through multiple hops and so on. Uh, one of the challenges they face, like I said, their end customers, like World Bank, United Nations, embassies, Coca-Cola, and others operating in these regions, they have strict SLAs with them, and they need to make sure that they meet those SLAs. Um, some of the challenges they, they faced before they started using us, poor reliability and performance. Like I said, in, in general, um, the business model is that you know there is some some issues with the customer, and you have to pay some penalties. It was it's like an accepted model of doing business, uh, and they face these huge challenges. 
they actually tried in the field with many many of the existing or other SD-WAN competitors which are there. And they found that the tunnel overhead caused a lot of issues. They have a large layer two network, which they already have, that's doing encapsulation. And when they put uh, another encapsulation on top of that, they're hardly sending any data. And they find that the end customers, they actually use a third party tool, the end customers use a third party tool for monitoring. And they, they monitor what's the, what's the end to end, um, uh, what do you say, the SLA they're getting. And they monitor that and they base their, their judgment on that of whether they have to pay penalties or not. Mm -hmm. So traditional SD-WAN had a lot of issues and that lead to, leads to poor customer satisfaction. Uh, obviously, they have deployed us. Currently, we are we're deployed, like I said, in more than 40 countries. Uh, in, this is the phase one diagram where we are. Um, what they did is they have pretty much the, one of the few who took us directly to a POC. They actually took us to one of the sites which had problems and said, Let's see you know, what you will do here, and let's see how it works. I have in the next, what happened in the POC in the next slide. But the idea is basically prove your, your things work. Uh, phase one, we were deployed in 14 countries, and they have won some enterprise customers. They now have a GA version of the product. They use um, silicon boxes, um, which are four core Intel Atom processors, and they put R120 software, and they ship it as an appliance to their end customers to deploy. Currently, it's deployed in more than 40 countries, and like I said, CRAN is their, their version of SD-WAN, they call it, uh, and they're working towards, towards getting ready for STEP. And they also, one thing they noticed is that now, since they're able to offer um, good SLAs to their customers, they actually want to move away from doing capacity-based charging or bandwidth-based charging to actually charging based on the SLAs they deliver. They can flip the thing around and say, you all originally used to tell us that we are not meeting the SLAs. What how about we sell to you based on the SLAs? In the sense, we will give you 10 meg and we guarantee that or whatever, you know, and this kind of rates and this kind of drop rates, this kind of latency and so on. So they actually want to flip and uh, base their services on the SLAs. That way they can monetize better the services they're offering. Uh, these are the sites they chose for, the, they chose a remote site in, in, in near Johannesburg and Swaziland and they put our routers in and they, they tested it. One of the things we noticed is that our routers, in case of degradation or latency, if you look at it, the first one shows bandwidth over WAN 1, bandwidth over WAN 2, and latency. As you look at it, as latency changes, we switch over the traffic to the other bandwidth link, and we are able to deliver the SLAs they require. Lane was actually involved in this. These are actually his graphs. He was involved in this deployment, and he tried and tested it with them. Um, any comments on, on the... On the user experience, they also had the feature request, and we made it happen. Yeah, well, um, one of the things, and we've talked about the fabric fragmentation numerous times today, but it was very, very important to them, um, based on customer requirements, that they be able to deliver their service with a full 1500-byte MTU to the end customer. Um, so, you know, and we're encrypting it. So it, when you do that, it is going to exceed 1500 MTU. So that fabric fragmentation is a very, very important feature for these guys. And uh, they're, they're pretty thrilled with it. Oh, we did this. Uh, this is another thing I took for the same thing for packet loss. As you look at it, as packet loss changes, uh, packet loss increases. That's the same time we switch it over, the ba over WAN 2 and we are able to de deliver the SLAs they want. Um, the end result for them, um, they have improved, improved throughputs in sites which they have used to have poor performance and of course improved SLAs. Overall benefits, um, they see improved performance, zero downtime with failures because of the switchover, better utilization of low cost links and cost savings. Uh, we have a case study written with them, jointly written with them and it's up on our website with CMC and a managed service for partner we have called Redwine. Um, actually, there are links on these presentations, if, 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 or you can you know, look at our website. But this is available um, on, on our website to read. The other use case I wanted to talk about is Converge One. Um, who they are, um, they provide um, Unified communication services to 11,000 enterprise customers. Not only unified communication, there are many different kinds of services they provide. Unified communications is one of them. Uh, they have 11,000 enterprise customers. They serve about 73%, which is 73 of the Fortune 100. Uh, they have 2,000 employees. Uh, they're big in the United States. Uh, they are a leading provider of, like I said, unified communications and other technology solutions. Uh, one of their needs was what currently have their, their original design was if you want unified communication services, you have sites, you bring your MPLS link into our into their data centers and and integrate with their voice backend. Um, and 
the main main concern they had with this kind of, of solution was that it takes a long time, obviously, for an MPLS connection to come into their data center and for the customer to bring their MPLS router in. It also doesn't provide great SLAs at the end because the customer has to do a lot of the legwork to bring the CE router in, place the CE router in, in their data center. It's not really a managed service offering if the customer has to do all that work. And of course, they're stuck with using MPLS and high cost data circuits only. They wanted to switch over to uh, using um, internet paths, obviously. Now they have, um, using the 128T solution, they call it the, the uh, C1 SV router, uh, Converge 1 um, SD-WAN router. Basically, they place, place the customers, uh, the, the 128T routers at the customer sites, and of course, they have the 120 router in their data centers. Now they can provide connectivity over MPLS and internet. They also have the ability to do that over two internet paths. If you have two ISPs with two internet connections, they're able to provide and guarantee this kind of SLAs. They, they call this for small medium redundancy and for MPLS redundancy. They have both classes of service they're offering to their customers currently. Uh, they have a number of customers. They have one through this already. They use the Laner devices, the Laner 4 core. Again, the four core Atom processors uh, with our software on it um, for the deployment. One of the things they like about the feature is that you are able to select paths based on MOS scores. Um, and they have it set in their network currently. So what we do is we basically monitor MOS, uh, MOS scores for different paths in the network based on the delay, jitter, and latency that we see in different paths. We calculate perceived MOS, MOS scores for voice traffic. If at any point we see that voice a MOS, MOS score declines, we can switch over traffic to another path in the network. Um, the advantage is you can set MOS score, you can just say keep it over a path which has four, um, MOS score of four at least all the time, and it will do that. Uh, one of the use cases they had, um, it's also documented in the, in the webinar I did with them, they, had, uh, they have an end customer which is a credit union in the, in the US. Uh, and they had launched a call center when they went live with Converge 1. Uh, and the call center was having 800 calls. The MPLS provider, unfortunately, dropped their MPLS connection. And so everything switched over to LTE, and they didn't see a glitch. Obviously, the MPLS provider looked really bad, but we looked really, we came out as heroes. It was, a, it was a good use case to see in the field that it happened. And we actually switched over all the 800 calls without any, without any issues. Uh, Converge 1 and we looked very good in the customer's eyes in front of the credit union. But this is a live case in which it happened in the network, and we actually routed all the calls over. Uh, some of the benefits they see and the benefits they offer to their customer, SLA extension. Um, now they are able to provide SLAs over internet to any, any customers. Because it's a software-based solution, they see advantage of that. Like I said, they're using the LANA units. They order the LANA units through a partner of ours called Arrow, uh, and they use it to deployments. This is session aware. They see all the benefits of fast failovers. Obviously, the use case where the traffic switched over was, was one of the big things. And of course, since they're providing enterprise communications, they need to guarantee uh, a zero trust network. So it helps them to have FIPS compliance and, and PCI compliance and other things in their network. Um, the other use case I wanted to talk about is barred materials. Uh, they are um, a construction company in, in the US. Um, they, are, they have mining locations in these three states. Um, they have 20 ready mix plants and 30 aggregate sources. They basically get all these materials from different parts to their, to their uh, main locations. Uh, one of the challenges they face is that the network is not very reliable. And also, it's, they have very varied connections because these are some, of, some of these sites are remote. So they are very varied. They, and it's not like they have an ISP who will provide a guaranteed link or, or some sort of um, SLA. Um, the current network they had, the original network they had, uh, they would have sites. Um, they usually use the point-to-point -point wireless connection for their deployment, and they also have DSL one and DSL two from some in, on some sites from their uh, from their providers. One of the challenges they face is that they always want to get a feed, a, like I said, a video feed, which tells them how many trucks are passing the gates. The reason they need that is the number of trucks tells them how much, how much materials are coming into their sites. If they don't have that feed, they're in the blind. They actually don't know what's going on and how much materials are going to come today and what's going to happen. They can't really plan for it. So they need that video feed at any cost. So they want to, what they want to do is they want to get that video feed. They want to have instantaneous failover. Anytime there's a failure, they can't tolerate it. They need to get the link to switch over and the video feed to reach there. They obviously want to monitor, to have that video feed have the highest priority. 
in case anything happens in the network, congestion, they want to get that video feed. They want to balance load, they want to monitor, monitor everything centrally, and they want to limit aggregate bandwidth. And of course, they want to reduce costs and other things. Those, those are common to everybody. What they have done now is they have switched to using the 128T solution. They actually place our conductor in the AWS cloud. Um, they use QoS and T for rate limiting and prioritizing that video feed. And of course, they have LTE uh, for multiple connections. And for remote sites, they use LTE. Because of that, they have instantaneous failovers. They are able to use the, they also use LANA, the LANA boxes, uh, the Intel four core processors on different sites. And they have, of course, real time monitoring and load balancing. One of the advantages they see is obviously they are able to see that video feed all the time. They believe that because of that, they see a saving of 1K per truck per day uh, because of that improved connectivity they get. And they're able to monitor the feed and make better judgment about their business. They, of course, have multipath optimizations and now lower costs. Overall, they think they're saving about 50% compared to any other SD-WAN offering they had. And finally, the last example I want to give before I take some questions or switch over to the, uh, the cloud, we switch over to the cloud demo, is Revation Systems. Uh, Revation provides unified communications to 300 hospitals in the US, uh, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, they have spread out over 20 states in the US and three countries. Um, since they are providing unified communications to hospitals, they need to have 100% uptime or guaranteed SLAs. One of the challenges they face, obviously, <coughs> is that they don't control the network in the middle. Usually what happens is the hospitals have, they call them up and say when there is a degradation of service or when there's issues with the calls, they'll call them up and, and, and talk to Revation. Revision does debugging and so on, finds out what's happening. Oh, the ISP in the middle is not offering the service or you know, has dropped the connection or some, and stuff like that. Um, they, they usually are able to not, they don't control the network in the middle, so that leads to issues. What they want is to extend their, their, their uh, ability to deliver these services to the customer prem itself. Um, this, is, this is what their deployment looks like. They currently have it over multiple ISPs connected to different hospitals and to their data centers. Um, their data centers, of course, also host our conductor, uh, which tells them who's, who's where. They are able to get end-to-end -end control, hyper-segmentation, all the other benefits we talk about. Uh, one of the, the, the best use cases they have is that they say that now they are able to extend the SLA from their data center to the customer site. They are able to guarantee those SLAs over a third-party link. Uh, again, we have a, a case study written with them, and it's also available on our website. You can read more about it. How do you mean that other SD-WAN solutions failed? In what way? Uh, most SD-WAN solutions, like we, we noticed, at, at least the, 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 in the trial which Revation did, is that whenever there's a failure in the network and it switches over and creates another tunnel and fails, fails over, usually the voice call drops and they have to reconnect the call. It leads to poor experience for the customer. In our case, the failover was always instantaneous. That is why they thought that you know, it's more superior to the, exist, to the other SD-WAN solutions they tried in this deployment. Uh, in most cases, we have noticed, like I said, the two issues with the, the backup tunnels. One is it either locks the IP address and you have to pay for data all the time from the LTE network. You can create a backup tunnel and keep that up, just send a ping once in a while and keep it up. But then you have to do that. And the other is basically when you do it on the fly, it takes a long time. It usually takes time to get that IP address from the LTE network and fail over. It usually works well when there's two wired connections, but usually there's an issue with the LTE network. That's what we have noticed, yeah.